Well, good morning and afternoon, everyone in APEC. If you're joining in us from um, America or outside of the region, it might be night time for you. Well, welcome to the fifth workshop in the Degorator series, Academic Libraries Reimagined, which is a platform that we created um, to foster knowledge sharing within the Liberian uh, community and with anyone who might be interested in the topics. Before we get started, um, there are a couple of house rules for the sessions. Um, so you might notice that your audio and video has been turned off. So any questions that you may have during the sessions, please type them into the chat box. And if time runs out before all questions are attended to, we will contact you after the event. And likewise, you know, feel free to drop us a line um, if there is any other query you may have after the sessions. This session is about 90 minutes long, including question and answer, and it will all be recorded. The recording and PowerPoint will be emailed to everyone after the event. So feel free to share it with your colleagues. So we have with us today from Australia, University of Queensland, Julie and Lucy, managing a client experiences. Samantha, the Lead for Service Innovation and Excellence at Nyan Technological University, Singapore. Last but not least, and John, uh, Managing Director for Thriving Under Fire. Um, and kickstarting the session will be Dr. P. Singh, who's the Director, Center for Knowledge and Information at Sian Xiao Tong Liverpool University. Um, before I pass on to our first speaker, um, here is actually a preview of our next webinar for 2023. We are also actively looking for volunteers to speak in this topic, and you will be able to find more information on how to contribute on that in our post event email. And I also would like everyone to you know, remain with us till the end because we'll be doing a lucky draw live after the session and answer where we'll be giving away some uh, e gift vouchers and the names will be randomly drawn. Um, so sit back and enjoy. I will now pass on over to our first speaker, Dr. P. Singh, to start the sessions. Okay, thanks, uh, Devania, for the uh, introduction. And also, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, let me firstly share my slides. Okay, so I hope everybody can see the slides. Is that okay? All right. Yes. So um, uh, for this, thank you for having me here. And uh, good morning and good day, good evening to all the uh, um, uh, participants in this session. Um, so in the next 20 minutes, I think I just want to uh, very briefly to share uh, some practice from, uh, from my library. So firstly, let me introduce myself. So my... Uh, my role in our university is a uh, director of Center for Knowledge and Information. Actually, uh, it uh, contains five departments, including the library. Uh, so, and also I'm the director of the Learning More, uh, which is a new initiative in our university. I will show you more details about that later on. So, uh, firstly, uh, I will cover. Uh, Uh, the topics um, will focus a little bit on the on the technology in the library, but also I might uh, talk something more beyond the library uh, in a broader view. For example, in a, in a, in a higher education, and also uh, for example in a, in other departments, I'm looking after, for example, IT, and also learning more. So uh, this is about our university. Uh, the name is Xian Zhao Tong Liverpool University, which is a joint venture university founded and uh, established in 2006 uh, with two universities. One is from UK, Liverpool University, and another is uh, another top university in China, Xian Zhao Tong University. So these two universities come together and uh, they created a new independent uh, university that is us. So now we have only uh, 16 years history. Uh, we started from only 
163 students in the first year in 2006. But now we have, uh, in each year, we have more than 8,000 students, including uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, and also PhD students each year. So we have around uh, 25,000 students registered and uh, 22,000 students studying in, in our city in Suzhou and another 3,000 studying in UK. Uh, something I, I think I need to mention is that our university is truly an international university. Uh, the staff member and the students came from around 100 different countries and regions from all over the world. And we are teaching English. Uh, so that's uh, generally about uh, our university. Um, so before I start, I want to share some insights with you. Uh, this is came from a Pearson Global uh, Learner Survey. Actually, they, they are they are kept doing this uh, in the past four years. Uh, in each year, they will give some uh, thoughts and some uh, key points. So I want to share uh, this this version in 2019 because this is just uh, this was just done before the pandemic. And also we may find some insights here quite interesting. For example, before the pandemic, before globally people started to use online learning and teaching, actually uh, in this survey, uh, they revealed eight key points. The first one is a, a DIY mindset is reshaping education. That means actually people are talking about, they would like to, uh, to be able to customize their learning, right? So uh, a kind of self self paced way, uh, interest oriented way uh, to 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 have their education. So they they, uh, for example, in a university, uh, if everyone choose a program, so generally uh, the courses or the modules are, are designed by the university. So uh, the learner cannot truly, e even though you know, some university they can choose. Some option, optional courses, or uh, but they truly cannot decide what what they really would like to study. And also, the second one is uh, people never will do one job for their long for, la, 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 for the whole life. Uh, people are, are keep changing uh, their career in in the in the in the in the internet era. And also, uh, people expect digital and the virtual learning to be the new norm in the next decade. Please be noted that this has been, the conclusion has been drawn before the pandemic. And also people are willing to uh, have more uh, education in softer skills rather than uh, in, a, in a, uh, the subject learning is important, but people would like to have more uh, education in terms of the softer skills. And also um, uh, people don't think uh, young people don't think that a university degree is truly essential or is a necessity for their career development. So that generally uh, they, they have found in, in the, by the end of 2019. And this relates to something I am going to talk about uh, because we are doing something uh, based on a quite similar. We have similar ideas to what I've just, uh, just shared just now. So in our university, um, uh, I am looking after five departments, including library, IT, and also learning more. Uh, within learning more, actually, there are three different functions. One is uh, technology, um, re education technology, and also um, further education. And also uh, the third one is uh, a training to, uh, to teachers, uh, to faculties. So we, we, we train them how to better use technology to teach. Uh, so. All the keywords here is not, uh, is not only for the library. It, it is not only for, for, for my center with all the five departments. Actually, it's something that uh, in a university we, we really value. So for example, we, uh, we keep uh, a future-oriented uh, man site. And also uh, we want to create something that students could have, uh, even though they are not uh, based on our campus, uh, even though uh, in the past three years, uh, quite many of our staff members and the students are, have been kept in their home home city, uh, but also we we just keep the uh, the learning teach daily learning teaching uh, operated as, as usual, and also we we try to do something 
uh, to help people to be able to, to learn, continuous to learn and to, to, uh, to do the upskilling for themselves. So um, reshape the university and education is something with quite big vision. That's actually something we are trying to do. And also we, we aim to create a community for learners and researchers globally, and also to drive for change in learning and teaching uh, by either use a technology or by explore how the physical campus could be organized. So um, this is um, the, a kind of, uh, we call the landscape or a kind of um, a structure. If you would like to, uh, to understand better of what, uh, who we are and what we are trying to do. So uh, in our university, we have uh, different education models. Um, we call the model one, uh, 0, 2.0, and 3.0. They, they have uh, just like the slides show the different focus. Uh, but generally, we are, uh, we are trying to have more interaction with the society, with the community, with the industry uh, to deliver our education to our students. For example, the uh, module, uh, uh, model 3.0, we are working with the government and the industries to create some new kind of new form of academies or schools. So uh, the, the people from outside the university can very actively participate in design uh, the programs and also uh, they could even provide more opportunities for our students. So our students could have uh, opportunity to have more uh, hands-on experience during the study with the university. And you can see that actually learning more is, uh, is underpinning its infrastructure to support uh, the delivery of our university. So this is a, a schema that I draw to show, uh, to show to people either uh, from within our university and from outside our university to understand uh, what we, we are doing is called learning more. And also you can see that learning more is working very closely with libraries, with uh, IT, with universal mass communications, uh, even with a museum, because a museum looking after all the culture from the university, working together and we provide support to our schools in different models. And also we, we have direct uh, delivery of education to individual learners from online, and also we, uh, we have uh, the customized projects uh, to provide the training to the officials in the government and to the executives uh, and high level uh, um, officers in, 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 in the, from the foreign companies. So this is just a general uh, uh, kind of schema to show what we are, uh, we are doing. Uh, most importantly, we will be able to, able to put all the external resources together uh, and through learning more, and also by collaboration with all these departments, and then prov provide a more um, stronger support uh, to our schools. Uh, so generally, from, from my persp perspective, I never see library as only, uh, as only a department to provide support. Uh, I see library as actually a very active player uh, in the university, in this ecosystem, because something uh, the, the schools, obviously, they have their uh, expertise in their subject, but also in this uh, digital era, in the, in, with everything uh, can be provided on internet and by uh, technology. I think library can play, uh, are playing a very important role, for example, to, to educate our faculty and the students, uh, for them to better understand how to efficiently to use the resources uh, from the internet, how to evaluate and how to uh, make sure that um, it is truly something could be trusted and also uh, how to efficiently find search the information and knowledge, how to manage it and uh, even, so we have lots of things to do. So um, the, the faculties, they have uh, the very deep knowledge in their subject, but may have some very narrow knowledge about in the, in the broader uh, scope, but, uh, librarians could fit the gap by providing to either faculty and the students more knowledge and training. So, um, so that's my idea uh, about library. So we use, we use a lot of technology in our university, for example, uh, this is all the, the, the photos we've taken 
uh, with our, uh, this actually is, uh, this gentleman is our executive president, uh, Professor Xi Yongming, uh, and also uh, our teachers and our students, our colleagues, uh, this just show how we using technology. Uh, for library, uh, apparently we uh, experienced this transformation. I don't think we need to talk much about this. Everything has been digitalized uh, and more and more content already uh, are being produced and the ball uh, in digital. So we need to think about our role. Uh, previously, we have been uh, trying to focus on, on the students learning and provide better experience for students in terms of their learning. So we call ourselves a learning center. And also uh, some, some libraries, uh, if the university is a research intensive, so library have to be uh, uh, to give most research support and also learning hub and a learning commons. We have lots of concepts in the, in the past. So we, with everything being digitalized and also uh, all the knowledge information available everywhere. So library have to rethink uh, our, our role and also, uh, but I, I have truly have confidence because the library is always on the, uh, is, uh, on the, uh, how to say that, on the fr frontier uh, of the technology because we, we, are, we are quite future oriented. So uh, lots of things have actually been developed by the library uh, in the information uh, field. Uh, just to give, a give you a taste about how our learning more uh, looks like. Uh, generally, we focus on the uh, degree education and also we focus on lifelong learner. So for this part, it is only available by our uh, faculty and the students. And for this part, it is available to everyone globally. Uh, back to the library, uh, we, we have five year strategy um, for, for every five years, we have a strategy. For the uh, strategy point four, it is to drive forward library innov innovations and the new technologies. So I will give you some examples so, uh, to show how we are using technology. Uh, the first one is RFID. I think this is not new thing. Uh, it quite uh, easily will ha help our uh, librarians. For example, uh, uh, quite many things could be uh, students could use a self-service machine and also to check out the books uh, more efficiently. And uh, also we do not have to do the manual check uh, of our of all, the, all the properties uh, every year. So uh, that, that's, that's one thing I think uh, is quite easily could be understood. Um, this is uh, the, the benefits of, of the advantage about using RFID in our university. I think for many universities, you already have have it in place. Okay, so this is a, the, the true uh, scenario and some pictures and videos. I'm not sure could play the videos. Okay. This is to the, to the stock charting. Uh, it's an annual activity, uh, huge workloads and also this is to check out the books. Okay. And also we, uh, we really value that data. So I, I, I was leading my team in the last year. We, we, have to, uh, we have complete application in a national level, the data management, management uh, uh, kind of certificate. So the, the data is actually an asset for the university in the nowadays. So if you look into the data and to dig into the data, you might find medicine, uh, which is quite interesting. So for example, we use a data analysis to, to deal with the budget planning and also to help us to do the decision making about which should be renewed and which should not be renewed. So in each year we produce a report to show uh, the cost per download, the cost per, per use. And also uh, we will we'll uh, make a decision whether or not to renew any item rate. So for very low usage, uh, which costs not much, we will have a negotiation with the schools uh, and uh, we will discuss with them whether uh, it is better to, to provide uh, the, the full text to you, use other alternative ways. 
Um, case three, this is a dashboard. Uh, we, uh, because we have all the data already integrated together and uh, use a data visual uh, visualization tools to do it. So this is a good way to show the value of the library. So for example, uh, the presidents or the high, high uh, senior management team might ask you what's the value of library? Why you spend so much, so much, so much money and what's the outcome of it? So that's a way actually we can show the true the usage and the, everything is real time. And uh, uh, this could be accessed by our SMT, SMT as senior management team. Uh, so for any time they just click in, they could show uh, how many people are inside the library, the books borrowed, everything. I want to mention that uh, even for the, for the uh, how many students enter the library and how many left and uh, how long they stay in the library, this data could be used uh, together, working together with students affairs office for them to identify uh, some risks of students. For example, um, many, many years ago, I think even uh, in more than 10 years ago, uh, I firstly used this data and I showed it, it to the management team and also to the students affairs to say that among thousands of students, uh, there are around 60 students they have never never entered the library. So th there's no record of them. So these students could, should be paid attention by students affairs office, either to check their status. So uh, based on this, actually our uh, students uh, develop a new uh, system, uh, put all the, all the behavior uh, data and facts together and help to identify the students at risk. And for sure, we, we keep the privacy of students only uh, the, the staff member who should know, uh, who should be uh, informed, will get access to those information. But it's just a case to show how we could better use a library data. And also we use a lot of applications, for example, labor guides that uh, um, on a daily basis, we have we have we receive lots of queries and uh, requests for help. So uh, we take initiative to do analysis into it, and uh, we take out those very frequently asked questions, and then we design uh, we call um, uh, a guides uh, to subject guides uh, based on different subject. So they will help a lot to reduce the queries, and uh, uh, together with this, we call a lib answer. Uh, together, uh, we could provide uh, a lot of use, a lot of plugins and uh, uh, those small applications put them together. We could provide to our um, uh, staff member and students uh, integrated interface if they have any query or question. For example, uh, they could uh, during the uh, the daytime from nine to five. So we have uh, colleagues on. Uh, they they will they will work in, uh, uh, to to watch uh, the questions and they give them a real time chat and help and uh, uh, during the off work time uh, if anyone asks question uh, that question will be be sent to us we call it a ticket system uh, by email and uh, uh, that tickets will be allocated to the person who actually looking after that business and also we encourage everyone just to check the first. Uh, to find the information, uh, to find the answer by themselves. If they could not find an answer, they could ask, ask and also use a ticket system to, uh, to interact with our, uh, affect, uh, our leasing librarians. So uh, this is the last one. And uh, uh, we developed our, we call it live. Actually, it's an online learning platform. Uh, many years ago, uh, because the library, as I said, we, we have our uh, strengths, right? We, we, know, we know quite many things that professors do not know. So uh, for all the trainings, we actually divide them into a kind of very formal, uh, even with a module code, uh, and we provide, provide them on, uh, through our uh, online learning platform. This helps a lot uh, in three years ago uh, when the pandemic outbreak uh, we, we transferred everything immediately to, uh, from, from offline to online and give our students a lot of great support and even to, for faculty staff members, we give them great support through this online 
uh, learning platform and also online uh, um, surveys platform. Um, so I think that's generally I want to share with you um, uh, within these uh, 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yixing. Uh, we do have a question from Michael Su uh, asking if the labels um, undergrads, postgrads, are they useful for designing services for students? Uh, okay. So, uh, sorry, I, I did not, I'm not quite understand the question. So are the label undergrad, postgrad still useful for designing surveys for students? I'm quite not understand what does postgrad mean? Okay. Uh, but maybe in general, do you um, differentiate the kind of services for like newly entered students versus, you know, students that is in the, um, much um, in the later year where they are almost going to graduate from the universities, do you consider the different uh, kind of requirements that might need might be needed by these different kind of students? Uh, yeah, we 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 have uh, uh, we have a team we call the uh, academic liaison and the reference uh, division. Uh, we have quite my, many uh, liaison librarians. The all of them have very good education background and uh, they, 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 they know uh, uh, they have a degree in, in, librarian, uh, in, in library science and the information. And also they do have a education background in some subject. So, so they are all uh, actually working with schools very closely. So they, they even, uh, for different schools, different ways. So you, they even be invited to the school level learning and teaching committee and also they, uh, they are working very closely with them in terms of uh, research activities. For example, um, to, uh, to create, uh, <clears throat> establish the, uh, the, the book, the book repositories, the books on the shelves, <clears throat> sorry, and also databases and uh, to help them with, uh, with the research um, projects. So for students also, we provide them a uh, different kind of level of service uh, on query, uh, even through the, the trainings and also uh, on desk, you know, a service desk, a desk. Every day there's a librarian will be there on duty. Anyone just could come there and uh, to talk with them, to ask anything, for example, for postgraduate students, if they have any problem finding, uh, uh, finding some uh, articles and they do not know how to uh, where to find the, the research articles, how to, uh, how to uh, even the reference style, many things like that. So uh, we, we do have different levels to support uh, different, different roles in our university. And okay. also um, uh, quite many uh, of them are, are offline, but also we, we have a parallel uh, online service as well. So in our university, we could now switch uh, anytime immediately from on-site operation to purely online operation because in the past three years for quite many times, we, we have to switch online for the whole university. Everybody switch to online. So and, uh, uh, during uh, nowadays, uh, we are more like a blended learning and teaching. So everything is, uh, is, is online and offline together. All right. I okay. hope that answered the question. I yeah, um, if not, you know, feel free to drop us an email and we can further clarify that. I'm going to move on quickly to the next questions before we start the second topic. So how do you know that students get information or guides from lead guides? Like what's the acceptance or participation rate for those kind of resources? Uh, yes, I, as, I, as I said that, we, we do monitor all the data. So I, I truly, I truly really, I, uh, I look into all the data and the facts. So for example, uh, from the data I showed just now that the, 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 the number of the downloads, the number of the uh, click, and also we, we do have a track of the access, number of access to our web pages, because I'm not, I'm not only look after the library, I'm looking after the university's um, branding, marketing and communications. So we, we track uh, the number of uh, usage and that we know where people came from. Uh, so, so we, yes, we 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 do know that, that uh, we do check those those numbers. So, 
uh, the, the participation, uh, the rate is very high uh, because also you could check. Um, so you, if you got many, many prob, uh, queries and uh, questions, that means that you, you do have a problem with information sharing. Uh, people do not need, people need to increase awareness. But if you uh, receive less and less queries on the same similar problem, that means you, uh, the, it works. The information page works. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, topic two, which is supporting wellness for librarians and students. I'm going to invite uh, Miss Julie and Miss Lucy from University of Queensland to share their experience. And again, I want to remind everyone that once the all the three speakers, oh sorry, all the four speakers for this topic has finished presenting. We will then address the questions in the chat box. So over to you, ladies. Sorry, just lost my mute button for a second. Um, thanks, Lavinia. So um, Lucy and I are here from the University of Queensland Library uh, to talk about how we supported. Um, the wellness of library staff uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd just like to start off um, with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which the University of Queensland is based. And at St. Lucia in Brisbane, that's the terrible and Yagara people. We'd like to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country and recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. As I said, we're from UQ, the University of Queensland. Um, and you can see on this slide um, our beautiful St. Lucia campus. Um, we're a research intensive university uh, that has over 50,000 students. Um, we've actually got some three campuses, three main campuses, and um, eight libraries over those three campuses. Um, the University at St Lucia, the main campus, is on um, around about 114 um, hectares of parkland, and that's bounded by the river on three sides. And we're around seven kilometres from Brisbane's city centre. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we had a mix of online and on-campus teaching and I'd like to say up front that we're going to talk through our experiences of COVID-19 but we know that they um, th that we were very lucky and that our experience of COVID-19 in Brisbane um, has been much easier than other parts of Australia and indeed other parts of the world. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk through um, today, timeline of, uh, of COVID-19 in Brisbane. And we're actually going to cover um, all three years. Um, and we've chosen to do this um, in, a, in a linear way. Uh, so we're going to work through from uh, 2020 through to this year. Uh, and really we've done that because I think it's important to um, understand the context in which we were supporting the wellness of our staff. And as time passed, um, some of their needs changed. Just to introduce ourselves as well, we're both um, professional librarians. Um, so, so not health, safety and wellness professionals per se. Um, We've both been working for the University of Queensland for around 20 years. Um, and when we started out on our journey, Lucy was the Workplace Health Safety uh, and Wellness Coordinator in the library. 
and I was a, a new and temporary member of the library's executive. Um, as we moved through um, to 2021 and 2022, I actually became the chair of the library's COVID-19 response team and also our health, safety and wellness committee. And Lucy was a key member of both those groups. So we worked really closely together, um, uh, really up until the beginning of this year on our response to COVID-19. So I'm going to hand over now to Lucy, who will talk to the next slide. Thanks, Julie. So working from home happened quickly for us at UQ. Though some staff had previously had approved home office setups, we did have concerns with the practicalities. Did everyone have a suitable chair? Did they have the right IT equipment? Fortunately, most of our staff had recently acquired laptops and our teams did work quickly to ensure they had a suitable IT setup. In some cases, staff went home with office chairs and monitors to improve their home office ergonomics. During this time, as Julie said, I was the Workplace Health and Safety Coordinator, and part of my role was to review telecommute agreements to ensure that staff had good ergonomics for their home workstations. After reviewing around 80, the university then relaxed their ergonomic requirements during this period and for future lockdowns. However, good ergonomics were encouraged, at that time, we also had a weekly newsletter where I wrote a regular column on health, safety and wellness, and that allowed me to provide information and resources on all aspects of wellness, mental wellbeing and ideas to improve ergonomics. While there was a sense of uncertainty about COVID-19, case numbers in Australia were low. On March 20, when Australia's borders shut, there were 184 cases in Queensland. There was a sense of we're all in this together. Early on, the library understood the importance of ensuring staff felt connected to their colleagues. Whole of library updates were held. Teams had regular Zoom and team catch-ups, sometimes to talk work, sometimes just to chat. Slack and later teams became essential collaboration tools. Every team within the library responded differently. Some had online morning teas, Others became well acquainted with colleagues, pets and family members in Zoom and team meetings. Some teams actually became more connected during this work from home period than they had been when they were on campus. While we could deliver most of our services electronically, limited number of staff remain working on campus, mostly providing a retrieval service for physical collections. Quarantine arrangements for books were introduced and risk assessments were undertaken to ensure these staff could perform tasks safely. Back to you, Julie. Thanks, Lucy. So, um, as Lucy has outlined, um, you know, our, our initial response um, to, to the pandemic and the need to work from home was one really of very much focusing on those practicalities, ergonomics, and then keeping connected. Um, but as um, 2020 progressed, um, uncertainty in Queensland grew. Restaurants, pubs, and gyms all shut. There were strict laws preventing people from leaving home. We saw panic buying in the shops and schools closed. And for that, uh, for our staff, that meant that many of them were juggling caring for and supporting the education of their children with trying to work as well. Travel in Queensland was limited for them. And Queenslanders watched the international situation and the situation elsewhere in Australia anxiously. So each morning, everybody stopped what they were doing to watch what was became known as the presser. So it was the press conference, the update given by the Premier of Queensland and the Chief Health Officer. And, you know, if, if this didn't happen when it was expected, 
or it was delayed for any reason. Anxiety levels grew and everyone would be keep checking to see what, what the reason for the delay was. And really in Queensland, our strategy was to keep the virus from spreading in the state at all costs. And just to give you an idea of, of how that felt, even though our international Australian borders were closed, Queensland also closed its borders to the rest of Australia. So what that meant for our staff was that in many cases, they were geographically isolated from family and friends. And to give you an idea of how things kept changing in that space, in 2020, in July, the border did open to all but Victoria. But by August, it got closed again to New South Wales, which is another state in Australia. Uh, and then borders did not fully reopen to the rest of Australia and in, until December, but then they were shut again to New South Wales. So it was an ever-changing border situation. And really in this state of anxiety, of uncertainty and of rapid change, we returned some staff to campus mid-year to deliver face-to-face -face services. And our approach here was really one of compliance, consultation, and then a mixture of reassurance and adaptability. So first of all, we formed a re return to campus team and that was a group that um, consisted of library staff from different areas of the library and also different levels of seniority and the group met regularly to discuss the practicality of how we could return to campus um, and it also provided a range, an opportunity for a range of voices to be heard. So we put arrangements into place, like many places, I'm sure, uh, to ensure that offices were fully occupied on each day. And we had staff working in a hybrid on off campus arrangement. In our public library spaces, we configured them to meet density requirements. We removed chairs and put them into storage. We removed computers. We put um, stickers on the floor. Um, to indicate uh, what physical distance will look like. And with these measures in place, we had around about half the usual student numbers on campus. And you can see from the quote on this slide that they really appreciated libraries being open so that they had a safe place to access Wi Fi and to study away from distractions and conditions of play. So prior to COVID-19, we had four library service points on our main campus, and we reopened only one of these face-to-face. -face. And to do that, we um, put risk assessments into place in, consult in consultation with staff to understand how we could safely provide services which involve contact. And we had to get inventive with some of our solutions. So, we introduced safety protocols which involve cleaning desks between use. Um, and we also trial delivery of services via video, video link. We really understood that our staff were nervous. They needed information and they needed opportunities to be heard. The tricky part for us was that the information and advice kept changing. Uh, so when we first returned staff to campus, masks were not recommended. Um, but of course that soon changed and then we provided masks for staff and we also installed perspex screens at our service points. So we had to adapt and keep adapting. We also, um, to support the mental wellbeing of staff, um, offered a series of emotional resilience workshops and staff also had access to psychological support through the university's employee assistance program. But I think it was also important for us to acknowledge that our staff were individuals. And so what suited one person might not suit uh, the next person. So for some staff, returning to campus, even if they could do their job really well from home, 
was very important to support their well-being. So we worked with staff um, to understand individual situations. Thanks, Lucy. By the start of 2021, we were still without an approved vaccine for COVID-19 in Australia. In the first eight months of the year, we had four small lockdowns in Brisbane when cases were detected in the population. Wearing masks became commonplace and for some periods of time, this was mandatory. Check-in with QR codes was also introduced. Information from the government was not always clear and regulations changed frequently. The Return to Campus group, later renamed the COVID-19 response team, had a role in ensuring information was interpreted and communicated to staff promptly. Many of our staff appreciated understanding clearly what they needed to do in the workplace. Regular updates also helped to inform and reassure staff during these periods of lockdown. The COVID-19 response team also had a key role in communicating the changing requirements to students using our library spaces. This meant adapting and updating signs regularly and thinking up new and engaging ways to encourage the right behaviour, like giving out coffee vouchers to say thank you for wearing a mask. While this, was, this supported the safety of our students, it also helped our staff working in public areas feel safe too. Clear communication was particularly important midway through that year when our main library was identified as a close contact site. Staff who had been in the library that day and their households had to go into immediate quarantine for 14 days. We also had staff in quarantine as their children's schools were identified as contact sites in the same cluster. We had no warning that we were locked out of the workplace and no time to collect possessions. We immediately held an all staff briefing to ensure staff knew what to do and to encourage staff to focus on their own mental wellbeing. Vaccination against COVID-19 was strongly encouraged by the government and the university. Staff were given time off to get vaccinated and on-campus clinics were set up. During 2021, as COVID advice changed, we adapted and improved the service delivery we had established the previous year. Microphones were installed on our Perspex screens at our service points to avoid the temptation to talk around the screens. We also had software to provide screen-based video call services as well. And that brings us to 2022. This year, and we started uh, this year with masks still compulsory in Queensland and COVID case numbers ride, rising following the opening of our domestic borders and relaxation of quarantine requirements for those entering Australia from overseas. So we'd spent the last two years reasonably successfully keeping COVID out of Queensland. And it actually felt really strange and wrong to see those COVID case numbers growing. Anxiety was high and staff who could work effectively from home were again encouraged to do so. We also saw domestic supply chains break down. Supermarket essentials became hard to find and that added to the feelings of stress and concern. Schools, which um, in Queensland start their academic year at the beginning of January, actually delayed um, the start of the school year. So again, our staff were juggling um, having children at home but working. And it really wasn't the start to 2022 that anyone wanted. What should have been a new beginning felt a bit like Groundhog Day and everyone was tired. So again, you know, all we could do really was communicate regularly and clearly to provide clarity and support to our staff. So 
So as the year's gone on, um, things have started to get back to what I'm going to call COVID normal. Both staff return to hybrid working. Um, we continue to um, have measures in place like social distancing, good hand hygiene, staying home when sick, um, to ensure safety for everyone. It's also important to acknowledge that many of our staff did actually catch COVID um, during this period, but fortunately, due to vaccination, most were not seriously ill. Throughout through the year, as health, safety, and wellness device matured, indoor air quality became a new concern, and the university implemented a program of monitoring, and the library um, purchased our own carbon dioxide monitor so that we can actually provide information promptly to our staff. We also had um, policies introduced so that vulnerable staff could access N95 P2 respirators. And only last week, um, the emergency COVID powers that have been in place in Queensland since 2020 ended. And Right now, students are back in our campuses. Staff are largely back in our offices, at least some of the time. Thanks, Julie. Um, so when we reflect on our COVID-19 experience, one of our key learnings is that health, safety and wellness orientated management is good management. It's also important to understand that health, safety and wellness is about the whole person. Where our previous focus may have been more on the health and safety aspect, valuing and understanding wellness is just as important and empathy and care in the workplace is vital. Since then at UQ Library, a new position of Library Health, Safety and Resilience Manager was created and recruited too. We've also learned that setting up response teams with representation from across the library is effective. Right now, we're considering transitioning our COVID-19 response team into a library incident response team. Partially, this is because we've seen how well this collaborative approach has worked. But it also reflects that along with COVID-19, over the last three years, we've had to deal with a flood and fires in our libraries and the impacts of regional flooding on our campuses. Finally, we know that we've built capacity among our staff and that we are a resilient lot. We're really hoping that 2023 will be a relatively normal year, but we know that we will be prepared if it isn't and that we can change when needed. Thank you. Thank you. And we're happy to um, answer questions. Uh, I don't see any questions now yet. Um, so I'm going to quickly pass on to, um, to Samantha to continue. Um, oh, we do have one, but we're going to address that at the end of um, the topic. Um, so we're going to pass on to Samantha um, to speak on behalf of the Nyan Technological University. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, thank you for your sharing earlier. It was very insightful to see what happened in um, around the world as well. So in Singapore, we also have had our ups and downs throughout these last um, two, coming on three years now. So we are, my, my presentation today is um, focused more on um, what we did to support staff and also our library users, um, but from a different perspective than the University of Queensland. Let me get back to this. Okay, so um, I'm focusing more on staff bonding during the pandemic 
and uh, some new initiatives that we have, and also talking about our huga and fascinature, which is our well-being space in um, our main uh, flagship library, Livinam Library. Okay, so let's start off with um, navigating staff bonding during a pandemic. Just to give you an overview, um, so NTU Library has about 70 staff. Uh, we are spread across seven different library offices um, across the campus. And so actually, even before COVID, um, in about 2013, we have a staff engagement committee, which was set up. And it's typically made out of like seven to nine staff. This is uh, on a voluntary basis, a two-year term. I think previously it was three years. Um, and the, the committee comes together to organize events and look after the general welfare matters of the library. So um, these are very well attended events because um, as you can imagine, for if the staff are separated into seven library officers, it's not very common that they will all get together and meet and see each other. So past events um, included like craft workshops, in-person workshops, um, games days, um, organized visits to cultural sites or li other libraries. And uh, our buffet lunches were very, very popular. So um, moving into the pandemic, the, the committee that I was a part of was the 2020 to 2022 committee. And so it was right in the thick of the pandemic. And uh, we've just passed, over, passed it over to uh, the next committee moving forward as well. So this is what we did during the two years um, when we couldn't meet. We held a lot of online um, meetings uh, just to bond with each other. So we had virtual craft workshops now. Um, we organized scavenger hunts. We had um, virtual step -athons. So we just encouraged people to go out and you know, take a walk around their neighborhood, um, get some fresh air. And um, we also made like a competition out of it. And we had music recitals and just general sharings about, you know, um, their, what is it like for them when they work from home? You know, I think it's quite similar. Everyone um, has to deal with, you know, family and, you know, if your, your uh, family member is also working from home, how does that clash with you? And um, fun stuff like that. Once we could come back to campus, um, one of the things that the, the committee did was also to uh, come up with this staff lounge. So previously, we didn't have a common staff lounge for us to gather, but we managed to clear out this old storage space that the library already had um, and create our staff lounge. Um, it's quite a big room. Uh, so we actually did up the, the wall on one side and we had furniture come in with sofas, monitors to watch movies. We had we brought in all our games that um, staff donated. Um, quite a few of the furniture here uh, were also donated by staff. Uh, we have a small little pantry area for people to um, make, have a, like a microwave and there's a coffee machine. So um, some people could come here and have lunch together. We organized, um, a painting. So this is actually a, I guess, a mural um, done up by the staff, you know, contributed by the staff. So um, because at the time when we organized this, Singapore still had a, a regulation saying that no more than five people can be in a group together. So we had to come out with staggered time slots and they, and staff were very um, enthusiastic and they, and they wanted to participate. So it filled up quite fast. Um, and you can see their contributions on the wall. Um, yeah, so this is still there today. Um, we might, you know, there's still lots of empty space. We're kind of thinking if we want to continue doing this in the future, but it does look quite nice, like just like this. Um, yep. Okay, so moving forward, um, now that uh, Singapore has relaxed a lot of its regulations, uh, we are doing more in-person things because we you know, miss seeing each other face-to-face -face after two years. Uh, so we have staff gatherings, we have upcoming Eat With Your Family and Friends Day, 
And um, there is a year end party that the committee is now currently organizing. And in the picture here, you can see the recent visit to our medical library, which is actually outside of our main campus. Okay, so now I'll be moving on to Huga and Fascinature. Um, this, so Huga is actually our well-being space that we set up um, in and launched in January 2021. So we actually had this space that was empty for quite a while and our university librarian um, said, you know, why not we come up with a well-being space? Um, you know, being in a university and the, the library, it's like quite a... Um, a space where students like will gather and that this particular floor is our fifth level which is the quiet zone so um, a lot of students go there for like very dedicated studying and it I think you know it has a lot of stress in that floor alone <laughs> so um, this space that we covered is at the end of the quiet zone we thought it was a very appropriate space to have this well-being um, room where they can like go in and take a break right so um, the unique design of this room encourages self-expression, self-reflection, and self-care through experiencing calmness and tranquility. That's the vibe that we were going, that we are going for, right? So why huga? Um, huga is actually a Danish word uh, for well-being. The, the Danes are thought to be the happiest people in the world. So we kind of want to learn from them, like what does that mean? Right. So um, it huga refers to um, the everyday kind of happiness, such as like coziness, um, absence of annoyance, and taking pleasure in the small, soothing things in life, right? So in the space itself, we have designed it to be low light. Um, the, we have beanbags scattered around, and it's strictly a no-shoe zone. So once you take off your shoes, it kind of feels you are like, it's a different experience, right? You take off your shoes, suddenly you are more comfortable, hit space, and you feel more grounded. And that's what we're kind of going for. So this picture is actually a launch um, done by our president, um, the launch of Huga in January of 2021. This is a glimpse of inside the space on launch day. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have collaborated with the NTU Museum and they launched uh, our inaugural uh, exhibition, A Familiar Forest. So the, the forest, Oh, sorry, the exhibition actually took up the entire space, the entire room. Um, and so you, as you can see, there are like um, panels hanging, uh, cloth panels hanging down. So it kind of contributed to the space. Um, uh, it's like meant to be like a forest at night. So there are speakers in the room to have sound and there, there are diffusers, sand diffusers around as well. And we also have this small little corner we call the nook where there were beanbags and um, a small little bookshelf there with um, the well-being titles. So you can see our president there enjoying the, the, the beanbags. Yeah. Okay, so um, Fascinature, sorry, um, Huga, our original um, Familiar Forest, the exhibition ended in middle of this year. Yes, I think middle of this year. Um, and the space itself, we do want to keep um, as a well-being space, but we intend to refresh the interior of it every now and then um, to bring something new and um, excite our users, right? So the team, our project team came together and we decided to, we designed this concept of um, fascination, which is actually not a word. It is a combination of fascination and nature. Right. It's actually inspired by soft fascination, which is a concept from attention restoration theory. Right. So um, our everyday lives actually require a lot of directed attention um, in studying, in working. Um, so once you have used up all of your uh, attention doing that, you start to become uh, more impulsive, you make poor decisions, you um, are generally more grumpy and annoyed. So what soft fascination is, is um, effortless attention, right? Um, and it, so nature is naturally fascinating, which is why we also decided to combine this together. And we have come up with fascination, which offers a multi-sensory environment 
inspired by elements of nature to encourage soft fascination and allow the mind to wander and rest and restore itself. Okay. So this is our provost um, on the day of our launch of Fascinature, which was about two months ago now. Yes. So Fascinature, is, uh, this is a very um, simple map of the space. So previously, Huga, uh, you can see where the barrier is there. That is where the room starts. But we have expanded the space now to include just a little portion outside of the room as well. Um, so Fascinature has actually four zones. Um, yes, so we have the transition area outside. So right after the shelves end on the left um, and the study areas end there as well, um, you move into a transition area where we already encourage, we tell students to please take off your shoes and you can enjoy the beanbags and the chairs there as well. So this, we have two areas there called view and gallery B. I will go into more detail about this later. Okay, so this is the transition area before we actually hit um, the darker space inside. So we still have kept Huga in low lights. And uh, there is, so the next two areas are admiration and slumber. This follows um, the soft fascination. Soft fascination. So, um, and then once you are done with uh, admiration and slumber, there is the awakening section of the space. Okay. So perhaps I'll go into more detail about the different um, areas here. Okay. So we have view which is actually a cozy setup. You saw um, the line of um, chairs near the window. So the chairs actually um, are meant for you to lean back and then look up so you can see um, the view of the sky and clouds going by. There are, there's a bookshelf that um, you saw earlier at the inside, which was inside the room previously. Now it's outside. Um, it has a selection of non-academic well-being titles for casual reading. And this corner is created for casual reading. Um, we know that reading is actually uh, direct, requires directed attention. Um, but in consultation with one of uh, the psychologists from the School of Social Sciences, um, they said that actually you know, uh, reading can be a relaxing activity if you enjoy it. So we have put out this area just for people who, who like to take part in this activity and it still wouldn't compromise the soft fascination elements within um, the dark area itself. Yeah. We also collaborated a lot with our um, community, NTU community. And here we have a gallery um, featuring nine photos by Ting Tong Ping, who is uh, an NTU alumnus. He enjoys being in nature and taking photos of nature. This gallery is called Viewfinder. Um, so the Viewfinder is what you look through when you're taking pictures on a camera, right? So the images are actually framed by negative space to suggest the form of windows. And each image is a window pane for users to look through and see what Dong Ping saw in his camera Viewfinder. Um, inside, once we go in, um, a lot of people immediately um, are a bit stunned because it's very dark inside compared to the outside. And so there's a small gathering area you can see on the left photo at the back there, um, where they can just sit there for a while and get accustomed to the, the light and um, the scent that we have put. Uh, and there's very soft music playing just to add to the atmosphere of it. Um, as well. Yes. So the um, moment we go in, on the left is a, a gallery A, uh, which is featuring the works of Jeannie Ho, a lecturer at the School of Art, Design and Media here in NTU. So she's a photographic artist and she, uh, as an artist, she is interested in the connection between nature and our mental states, which is why we reached out to her um, and uh, she was kind enough to contribute uh, some works of art for this, for Fascinature. So we have both troposcapes and sojourn landscapes. So troposcapes are, is on the left um, and encourages viewers to let their mind wander while viewing the vast expanse of clouds. And on the right, we have sojourn landscapes. So you can see the photos are actually very small. Um, they are actually meant this way so that you uh, would want to move closer and then it's a more intimate viewing experience 
or moments of, uh, in our everyday life which are easily missed. Okay. We also have converted um, our nook previously into a place we call now call scene. Um, so we have moved the shelves outside, we have kept the bean bags, we have added more. And um, this is actually a very well loved area because students like to go come here and uh, take a nap. Um, so for Fast Nature, we have actually prepared a video um, of uh, CC0 clip, nature clips um, to put on loop for students to enjoy. It's a very gradual move from scene to scene, um, going from morning to night and shows a variety of landscapes. It kind of feels like a cinema. Moving on into our awakening section, we have the Secret Forest, which is a conceptual ins installation um, by me, uh, a library staff. Yeah. So it's actually hidden in a corner. Um, this is also the only place inside Huga which has which is lit by natural light. So it's kind of, I wanted to make it look like a flor forest clearing. So you can see the swirl of greens on the wall. Uh, we also have pebble cushions that our provost is um, sitting on. And um, there's a small little grass patch with a wooden table there to add to the whole atmosphere. And we put some special filters on the window so that it, um, it filters in the light so it won't be so harsh. It, overall, um, people have described it as a dreamlike kind of atmosphere. So it's kind of to welcome them into more of a gentle awakening um, from once they uh, have passed the admiration and slumber phase. Um, the last spot inside uh, Huga is virtual. So uh, as I said, we did collaborate a lot with the members of our community. And uh, one of them was the uh, psychology division of the School of Social Sciences, uh, Dr. Xu Lin and Dr. Shara Chan. They um, actually co-authored a paper on how, the, how viewing nature, even through virtual reality, had benefits to our mental well-being. So if you're interested in the paper, I've left the link down here. Um, and so in doing our research, uh, when we were creating this space, the project team actually found this paper and we reached out to them to understand more. And um, they are still currently doing research on this and everything, but they, they do note that there are mental well uh, be sorry, there are benefits to our mental well-being when experiencing nature through virtual reality. So they were kind enough to loan us their equipment. Uh, so we have a little VR setup uh, in Huga at one corner. Um, this uh, place, this experience is um, kind of different from the rest of the experience you have inside Fascinature because this one is kind of a solo experience. Uh, everything else it can be shared with other people. But this one, once you put on the headset, that's just you're you're just alone there, and it once you, you can sit on the chair and be immersed into this one space. Right. Um, we set up the TV there just for launch day, just to show people, but uh, we have removed it because we don't want it to, we don't want people to feel self-conscious. Yeah. Um, so the VR game uh, actually has a variety of nature set, uh, scenes for people to choose and then experience. There are lots of things they can do inside. They can, um, some of it is like a forest clearing. They can um, feed the animals, they can change it into a nighttime setting, they can grow trees. Yeah, so yes. So to facilitate all of this, we have provided them with a comfortable chair and some instructions for how to use the equipment. So I think that's pretty much it. So I have some just some pictures um, of the launch. So we, here we have our university librarian, Ms. Caroline Pang, and uh, our provost launching Fascinature. And this is what the secret forest looks like from a different angle, just so that you can see the whole thing, and the project team for Fascinature. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank, thank you. you so I'll be happy to. Yeah. Right, um, okay. yeah. I'll pass on to uh, John, the last speaker for this talk. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, uh, greetings to you all. Just uh, give me a moment to set up here. And uh, da, 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 da. Hang 
and then we want to share screen. In about uh, the year 2010, a friend of mine was a senior in um, the education department in New Zealand and went to the United States on a study tour to see what uh, was the common factor in high school shootings in the United States. One of the things that he found out from the Homeland Security who had done the study was that in every instance, the shooter, the person, the perpetrator of these crimes had at some point in the week or two prior to the shooting, had spoken to a member of staff, not a member of the academic staff, but a member of the support staff. Sometimes they were janitors, uh, worked in the cafeteria or librarians and had mentioned their distress. And none of those people knew what they could do in response to that student's distress. And it was only subsequent to, to uh, then the, their uh, crime that they committed that these people realized that the student had made a cry, a plea for help. In this session will be very different from the ones that you have heard because um, what I'm interested in doing is uh, helping you to know that you can make a difference to the wellness of colleagues and students. Um, my name is John Fazandia. I have been a university chaplain a number of years ago. Um, uh, I'm a, trained as a psychodramatist and worked in alcohol and drug rehabilitation. Uh, I've spent the last 25 years developing the Thriving Under Fire program, TOUGH. I've done a huge number of face-to-face -face and online training, and I've written a book, which I'll make available at the end. Uh, I'm a partner with uh, the Workplace Skills Development Academy in Bangladesh, and there I have visited many universities, uh, uh, teaching students um, these principles, as well as staff, and I've worked in a number of ASEAN countries. In this session, we'll do, I would just like to share with you the simple counterintuitive actions that you can take to promote wellness. Um, and now we'll look at uh, three areas, the problems that students face, the problems that librarians face, your, you and your colleagues, and the counterintuitive steps to take to promote wellness. Um, so first of all, let's just uh, focus on uh, students for a moment. And um, I mean, life has got a lot more difficult. Uh, several years ago, we had a, there was a, a, a sort of a, a big um, thing in the paper where um, libraries, that's not academic libraries, but they had uh, headwear wasn't allowed to be worn in the library because it, uh, you know, people were hiding behind it. And uh, this um, lovely lady, she went into the uh, library and was told she was not allowed to be there because she was wearing a hat. And um, so, uh, but things have definitely changed, haven't they? That this is actually not a big problem at all, uh, such people moving to the library. And um, uh, we want to have a look at, and so what, you know, why can students be so difficult? And some even could be a bit scary for you. Now, uh, in a moment, I, I'll uh, ask uh, Lavinia to uh, put up a poll, but just um think about these here are six causes co that cause student unwellness their course workloads their family issue family issues and conflicts relationships and friendship problems financial worries the future of the planet climate war etc or other so uh if lavinia if you could please put up that poll and uh if you just select one that you think is the biggest they they all certainly do contribute to um students um, uh, their, their difficulties, but what do you think the students you come across, which is their biggest 
um, a, a challenge or problem that they that cause unwellness for them. I'll just give you another uh, minute, maybe. And um, Lavinia, you can probably see the results coming through, can you? Um, yes, I can. So when you've, when you've got a good number, then um, maybe another uh, 30 seconds to, uh, to vote on those. I think we can end it. Okay. Yep. So show us the next. Uh, what have we got there? Right. So um, there's there's plenty course workloads about thirty percent, family issues and conflict twenty three percent, relationship friendship problems thirty three percent, financial worries twelve, and the future of the planet about two. So thank you. Um, let's close that now. One of the problems uh, in all of these, what, what uh, these situations, it's it's the emotion that goes with the situation that really makes things difficult for people. And um, so working out how to manage emotions uh, in, in the library is one of your great challenges. Um, and one of the uh, what, what makes it a little bit more difficult is the the psychopathologizing of normal emotions that's a fancy word uh, but it's it's like um uh anyhow it's a good word to use psychopathologizing and that means that uh, once there was sadness and now there is depression instead of saying you're, you're sad we we were more inclined to think of depression once there was shyness and now there is social anxiety and um, again, once there was worry, and now there is stress. So these later words are all uh, more pathological than they are just normal feelings. So um, one of the, the big challenges really is being able for you as librarians, um, and I guess many of you are also uh, parents and uh, um, um, colleague, uh, whatever, but is, is realizing that many of the feelings that uh, do seem extreme for young people, uh, they, at, at another level, they are ordinary and they are normal, they're normal parts of feeling. And so um, it is possible for you, without being a trained uh, psychiatrist or psychologist, to respond to people uh, who show some of these feelings. And then uh, the second part of this is um, the well-being of librarians and uh, the problems. What are the, the problems that librarians face? Uh, apart from having to carry huge piles of books and uh, become very strong, which um, actually is very good for your health to uh, do weightlifting. Um, but just um, let's take a few moments now and um, we'll have a poll that will come up in a moment. And what do you think are the causes of librarian unwellness? And that highly emotional li library users or colleagues, your workloads, your family and relationship issues, financial worries, or the future of the planet or other. So, Lavinia, if you could put that second poll up, let's have a look at that and uh, just um, take a, a moment, a minute or so to vote uh, what you think is the, la the biggest cause of unwellness. <clears throat> and just another um, 10 seconds, Lavinia, if you've got enough um, responses that, to show us, uh, let's see what comes up there. Uh, yeah, I'll show the results. And um, so that's uh, quite interesting. So highly emotional um, users, 28%, workloads, 33%, family and relationship issues, 20 
financial worries 20, probably a little bit higher than the students. Um, and um, not so many of you worried about uh, the, the future of the planet. Um, might be because uh, we're all a bit older and uh, might not be there uh, so long in the future. But anyhow, um, so thank you very much for those. But again, um, all of these are, um, you know, the, the reality is that um, despite people feeling all these different things, uh, it's, you know, how can you respond when somebody shares some of their difficulty with you, and whether it's their, uh, you know, the, the, um, having to deal, have an upset, they've, they've just had an upset student that to deal with, or their own workload is getting them down, and yours is as well. So sometimes you're just too busy. Um, one of the other things that makes it quite difficult to respond to people is uh, what you learned yourself at home, how you were treated when you had feelings, when you were upset, uh, when things happened, and um, particularly when you're under pressure. And um, so, you, you know, some of that early learning, um, particularly, as I say, as a default setting, uh, comes into play. Now, the very simple thing that I can share with you in the short time that we've got uh, from uh, my book and from the program uh, that we've got, an uh, online program as well as face-to-face, -face, that these counterintuitive steps, and the first one and the most important one is to acknowledge the emotion. Emotions are neither good nor bad, they simply are, and they actually tell us something about our values, and they tell us something about the other person, or, but particularly for, for ourselves. So acknowledging the emotion. Now, when somebody is upset or you are you are faced with any, any or somebody is sharing with you about their different upsetness, um, you are affected as well as them. So they have their emotions and they might be even demanding things or weeping or um, shouting or doing anything like that. Well, that's their emotions, but you also have an emotional reaction. And unless you're able to manage your own emotions, you're not going to be very um, useful in helping them uh, in, in their well-being and working through this. So uh, the first thing is for you to acknowledge what's going on for you. And um, you do this uh, by, um, you can name your feelings to yourself. It's usually not helpful to say them out loud to somebody else, but to acknowledge them for yourself. And uh, in a non-judgmental way. It's not like I shouldn't be feeling like this. It's much more how interesting I do feel like this. And uh, so uh, you acknowledge your emotions. Now, upset people feel alienated and they need to be acknowledged. And um, now, I mean, a little boy like in this picture, uh, maybe it's a bit easier for you uh, unless you're the mother and he's in the supermarket and uh, throwing a tantrum. But um, you, you can you can feel for him. He needs to be acknowledged that things are a bit upset, uh, upsetting for him, and somehow things are not working out. Um, we certainly don't want to uh, tell him not to cry and everything's going to be all right because we don't know whether they, it is or not. Um, uh, but what we can say is, yes, you are very upset right at the moment. You are feeling something quite deeply, and um, recognizing that they are his feelings or her feelings uh, not not your own but you can still say yes and of course it is difficult um, because you are affected but nevertheless uh, it's about acknowledging uh, their feelings so you um, you know the, the challenge here is for you to listen without criticizing um, and uh, saying well you know you shouldn't feel like that you don't know how lucky you are and there's a whole lot of words like that that um, are quite critical, uh, or you shouldn't even speak like that. Um, the fact is they are speaking like that because they are distressed. And um, so it's not your job to be uh, teaching uh, somebody how, how to speak in this moment. You might do it later. But in the moment that they are full of feeling, you want to be able to listen without criticism. Now, feelings themselves don't need fixing. I mean, relationships do. So the flowers uh, may well be uh, appropriate, um, but her feelings, uh, which um, are quite hard to take, especially if you're a bit of a confused bloke at the uh, man at the back there, 
um, but her feelings don't need fixing. Uh, her feelings need to be acknowledged. Yes, she is furious. Or, you know, so he could say, yes, I can see. And uh, maybe in his case, it, it could be, uh, and I have done something that's caused you to feel this way. So, um, you, you know, the simplest thing in, in all of this really is to acknowledge the emotions, even when you are affected by them. So that means about you calming yourself down. Some of that actually is um, not only acknowledging your emotion, but the other very important thing to do is to breathe deeply in this moment, breathe from your belly. Um, you, you don't need your fight flight reaction uh, response has been activated or freeze in fact um, but you, you don't need this is not an emergency so you need to actually calm yourself down you don't need to fight you don't need to fly away uh, you simply need to be able to acknowledge that you're affected but then acknowledge them so you can say things like that sounds really hard you've had a hard time gee that sucks if you're a bit younger I'm not quite sure I'd say that myself uh, although when uh, for some when I'm talking to some young people, it does come out okay. So it's saying a simple thing like that. Now, if you're able to do this with your colleagues as well as with students uh, and with people at home when they are distressed, uh, you will be contributing hugely to their well-being in the moment. Um, and now, so. Um, uh, Here's just some things um, that I picked up uh, very quick. You'll see them probably in the, re uh, the replay or the um, when you get access to the, the slides, but ask questions rather than assuming that you know the answer. Um, just be more curious, but, but don't ask too many questions. Just let them talk. Be careful not to make it about you or compare your experience. Um, uh, you know, you, you might not think it's a very big deal, but allow them to tell you what's what's upsetting them. Um, it's not about fixing, so you're not looking for a, a quick fix. And I've worked with many librarians, uh, particularly around New Zealand, and many of them say, yes, I'm like that because that's what we do. We help people find information, books and things like that, but um, that you don't need to find a quick fix. You want to give people space to, to talk it out and um, if you are not the person, maybe you can just suggest they go and talk to somebody else uh, about their problem. So um, just to, in conclusion, I'd like to, if I could just take a couple of minutes to say a word or two about our training. Um, you know, how good would it be if you could, in fact, handle uh, most warlike customers uh, like this, <laughs> this person here in the shop um, and learning a new skill? Uh, yes, it's it's very good, but in fact, uh, you do need to learn lots of theory and lots of practice, and uh, so that's one of the reasons. And Daniel Goleman wrote the book Emotional Intelligence, it says that most training programs uh, have embraced an academic model, but this has been a drastic mistake. And the kind of training that uh, we've got online uh, and and the, what I've written about um, does that. So um, I'm I'm delighted with um, some of the assessments that we've had. Um, that our um, training has had very strong pedagogical uh, um, investigation and um, it really does stand out. And practically, uh, even people just doing the online program that we do um, from 17% uh, not confident at all afterwards, nobody was felt not confident and a huge increase in those who felt quite confident. So, if this is too much information, it's a huge amount that I've just packed in. That I usually do this as a two half day workshop. Um, you can, uh, um, I've got a book that you could uh, um, get, and normally I sell for $40 for, for you. If you put in the code, you get a, this is an e ebook in diff three different uh, forms. You can get it for $5, and those codes will be there. So, that's that's it from me. So it's a pause for quick for questions, and uh, over to you, Lavinia. Thank you.
And um, can I just ask for our speakers to on their video while we open the floor for questions? Uh, we do have one right after Lucy and Julie has presented. So I will direct this question to them. Um, so do staff accept returning back to campus, providing library services to users? Are they concerned about the pandemic and prefer to work from home in that period? Julie and Lucy? Yeah, I think it, it depends and, and depended. So our staff are individual. Some of them were keen to come back and mm -hmm. um, connect with colleagues. Um, I think others probably did prefer to work from home. Um, and I think, you know, for, for myself, because I can really only answer for myself, um, I um, enjoy working in a hybrid way. So I enjoy having that balance of um, time to focus at home um, and also time to connect with colleagues face to face in the workplace. And I think, in terms of concern about the um, pandemic, then, you know, we, we have to. Um, I guess put all those measures in place that we did. So, you know, make sure that we do our risk assessments in consultation with staff so that we can capture, um, you know, their concerns. And, um, but also, you know, make sure um, that, that we have the appropriate measures in place to address those concerns. I don't know if Lucy wants to add anything there. Oh, look, I don't think so, Julie. As you said, we can probably only talk about our own points of view. And I know for myself, there was an aspect of, of being keen to return to campus, but in that hybrid arrangement where I could have that flexibility to still work from home. Um, we're still a somewhat young family and a long commute for me. So to be able to work from home actually um, adds to my work-life balance. So yeah, that's from my perspective. Okay. I'm going to extend this question to uh, Dr. P. Singh and Samantha. So Dr. P. Singh, for your university as well, like, um, do you guys allow hybrid um, management for your staff after the pandemic? Uh, yes, indeed. It's a kind of blended um, working style. It's kind of a new norm in our university. So even, even now we have some uh, uh, some colleagues and students are outside the campus. So it's, it's quite it's quite a Euro way. Okay. And for Samantha, do you want to add on? Um, so for NTU, um, we prefer having people on campus. So uh, it took the management about two years for them to allow us to have work from home arrangements, like hybrid um, working. Um, but in general, they uh, we are uh, preferred to be on campus. So actually, um, uh, as you're moving back to the the norm, right? Um, a lot of classes uh, slowly, gradually also started to become more towards on campus. But um, they are still hybrid, and um, I think they still allow lecturers to decide, um, like if they want to put up like video recordings for the students to watch um, off campus as well. Okay, all right. And the next question we have is for Samantha. Is the vaccination in a library space? Um, yes. So, um, Fascinature and Huga is inside uh, Liwinam Library, which is our flagship library. Um, it, yeah. So, uh, NT Library is made out of seven libraries, and um, Liwinam Library is our flagship library. It's our biggest library. It, um, it is also our oldest library, I believe. Uh, and um, it is on the fifth level, where, which is our quiet zone. Uh, people usually go there for lots of like quiet study, very um, singular. They go there just to study. It's filled with like um, uh, individual carols. Yeah. So at the end right. of that zone is where we placed um, Huga and Fast Nature. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I don't see any question coming through. So we might move on to the lucky draw and give the attendees some time to, uh, to pose some questions if you want to. Um, so I'm going to just um, share the screen 
thing, and then you will be able to, um, to see a live um, draw. So let me know if you are seeing it. Yes, also. All right, so um, this uh, all the names of the registrations are being put into, so you might not be able to see them because it's quite small. So I'm just gonna click on this and get five names out of it. And then, you know, winners, please do contact me after this and then we will arrange for um, the sending of the prizes, okay? So I hope your name come out if you happen to be in the attendees for today. So we have our first uh, name, Trudy. I'm gonna just remove that, make sure that it doesn't appear a second time. And I will see you on next winner. Right, okay. So do take note of the name that you registered for this webinar. And two more names to go. Okay, and the last one. Sorry, that's a lack. Have a moment. Right, so we have our five winners. So I'm going to post um, the um, email that you need to contact me. And then we do have a couple of questions for Samantha as well. I uh, would like to clarify Huga and Vaccine Nature. Is it open to library staff and students? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I'll just answer first. Um, so yes, uh, it is open to staff and students. Um, the it's actually the space is actually quite conveniently um, next to one of our seven library offices. So people in that office can just go in by a back door. Okay. All right. Uh, so just out of curiosity, is is this a conversion of an existing space that you deem obsolete? Um, that you know you need to you know remake it. Um, so yeah, we are constantly relooking really at our spaces and how uh, users want to use it. So um, uh, that space originally was user space. It was just filled to the brim with shelves or books. And we realized that you know, the, the books had not been used in quite a long time. So we did our weeding and discard process and we removed a lot of the shelves there and it created this empty space and we wanted we you know decided to do this. Okay. All right. Um, so I have a question for John, um, but I'm going to let um, Samantha answer the next one, which is related. How do you finance the setup, the decorations for the new spaces? So we did have budget set aside for um, revamping the space. Um, I think we, we did manage to, we, I mean, we definitely used up our budget to do it. Um, but we we relied more on our collaborations with, uh, with the community to um, see how, uh, you know, they could contribute to certain things like the, the gallery and everything. Um, we did pull our resources together to, you know, have uh, art prints. Um, we looked at different vendors and how they um, were able to still give us quality work with, um, with which was more affordable for us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we did right. have to set aside budget for this. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So over to John. So it says that you begin mm. by mentioning that the people responsible for the U.S. school shootings initially approached um support staff in the school. So if this staff were the janitors or you know um, the counselors, if they were better able to listen to the students, do you think this would have prevented the shootings? Well, it would be good to think that it might have been, although we've got no idea what may have happened, but certainly um, we do know, and I, I know even from my own experience, that when just somebody acknowledges my own distress, this can make a huge difference to my level of tension. 
And I'm thinking about one time I went to the after hour surgery uh, when I was feeling very unwell and I needed to travel the next day. I was highly anxious. And I, as I was, um, the, the uh, person at the reception said to me, oh, you need to fill in this form. I said, yes, I'm feeling terrible. And she said, oh, that's not so good. Just that very simple thing of acknowledging what I had said uh, helped me just to, I, I almost said, I don't need to see a doctor now. You have cured me. <laughs> but these very simple things can make a very big difference. And so what, what I really uh, encourage you to, uh, um, um, to know and develop is that skill simply to acknowledge um, somebody's distress in that moment. And we've got no idea the implications and the, the consequences of that, uh, that, that how positive that might be. Mm. Well, I do, I do actually know how very positive it is, but, uh, you know, yes. So, um, and this training is, you know, relatively simple to get. Fits in with uh, Dr. Bizen's, um, you know, soft skills training, really. And, you know, that's for everybody. I want to teach students how to do this as much as staff everywhere. Mm. All right. Um, I do think that we have an overrun, and I hope um, this session has been important um, and you know um, beneficial to everyone. I guess uh, for this workshop, it's quite unique in the sense that uh, the inputs from the different speakers goes beyond um, the libraries itself. It can be applicable to anyone on campus, students, you know, faculty members, researchers, professors. So um, you know, if there's any detail that you would like. Uh, to hear more from each of these speakers, we will provide their um, email addresses in the post event emails. And I'm going to wrap this session up now. And I wish all of you, you know, a good day, a good night, and then I'll see you in the next webinar in um, 2023. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.